pray for okay. me. Okay, let's prepare that. Thank you very much. You can be giving us a preamble in, in the meantime while we prepare that. All right, uh, my name is Eddie Kiria. I'm uh, the managing director of Yalama Adventures. I'm also a board member with the Uganda Tourism Board, um, where I've been board member for uh, the last five years, currently in my sixth year and final year. But I've also um, been in the private sector for the last 22 years, yeah, in the tourism private sector, having started from the hospitality angle and then um, went through uh, to uh, mainstream tourism. So um, that comes with a wealth of experience that I hope that today we'll be able to interact and share those experiences. And uh, hopefully at the end of this discussion, um, we hope that one or two people will be motivated either to invest in tourism or to just join the whole value chain uh, of tourism. So um, my plea is that this be an interactive session such that you know um, we can be able to learn from each other and also um, take our industry uh, forward. Yeah. Hey, Eddie, we are getting the presentation set in a short while. We'll be able to start. Okay, beautiful Explore Uganda logo there. Let's put it in presentation mode. Derek, can we have it in presentation mode, please? We are going to get our presentation in presentation mode. Welcome everybody. It's the Business Recovery Series with Enterprise Uganda. My name is Belinda. We are going to be talking about the low hanging fruits in the tourism sector. And we have Eddie Kerr, who is a board member of Tour, um, Uganda Tourism Board. And he is also the managing director of Air Lama Adventures. Eddie is here and Eddie here is a presentation. Let us start. Thank you very much, uh, Belinda. Good morning again, our uh, listeners, all participants. Uh, it's a beautiful day today. Our country here in Kampala, it's shiny. And uh, what better way to start the day than discussing tourism. And I'm hoping that we're going to enjoy uh, ourselves as we you know, uh, deliver it further. Uh, just a simple uh, brief on uh, what I'll be taking you through today, today in our uh, presentation. One, we'll talk about uh, the Uganda Tourism Board in brief, and we'll talk about the mandate, the destination brand, so that we have a feel of um, uh, uh, what UTB does and, and their role in uh, uh, preserving our destination as a destination marketing organization. Then I'll also be taking you through the contribution of tourism to Uganda's economy. And then uh, we'll then delve into the real detail of our discussion, that is the low-hanging fruits in the tourism uh, sector. And then after that, we'll have a discussion and then uh, hopefully we can wrap up. Now, um, just a brief look at the Uganda tour Uganda's tourism destination brand. Um, as many of you may recall, in January 2021, the president uh, of, this, of our country, General M7, he launched our destination brand that had been a work in progress for almost two years uh, to coin uh, this brand identity and also have a brand menu for our destination. And we came up uh, with Explore Uganda, uh, the Pearl of Africa. And identity is such that it does combine uh, both a call to action, which is Explore Uganda, and then the Pearl of Africa, which is the brand essence. Uh, the brand essence is literally uh, that positioning statement that defines your destination uh, in totality. So uh, many of us are familiar with what the PAL means. The PAL is something that is rare, precious, and beautiful. And that is what Uganda is. You know, Uganda is not just a wildlife safari destination. No, it goes beyond that. And that is what we try to portray in this brand identity that we coined. On the right-hand side, you can just see the applicability of how the brand identity can be used. Now going um, into uh, the next slide, that is um, who we are, uh, Uganda as a tourism destination. And um, most of us know that Uganda is uh, uh, normally referred to as the Pearl of Africa, and that's the brand essence that represents us as a destination. And uh, uh, 
in our destination, we do. Uh, we are blessed to have uh, a source of uh, the River Nile, which is the world's longest uh, uh, river. Uh, we are blessed to have the largest freshwater lake in Africa, and that is the Lake Victoria. We also have uh, the Big Seven, yeah. And the Big Seven normally uh, uh, those in safari are familiar. Uganda, we add two, yeah. So on top of having the big five, that is the lion, the elephant, the buffalo, the, the rhino, and the leopard, here we add as well the uh, sets us apart. Then of course, talking of the bird species, we have 11% of uh, bird species, including the rare shoe bill stock. And that is something really to be proud of. Then of course, more than half of them are here with us in Uganda. And then uh, the Mount Renzori ranges. Uh, in Africa, because you know Mount Renzori is not just a standalone mountain, it's a mountain range. So that gives it a unique uh, a presence and profile. Then in terms of culture, we are unmatched with 60, 65 tribes and the fourth most culturally diverse country in the world. And then of course, uh, Uganda is referred to as the adventure capital of uh, East Africa, largely because of the water sports, and that's in Jinja, uh, that we are really blessed to have in this country. And in a nutshell, uh, there's a lot more, but this is what um, I could be able to, to coin out that really creates a point of uh, distinction for us as a destination. The next, sli next slide, please. Yeah, now these are just a few imageries. Uh, you can see the top of Mount Renzori with the king of uh, uh, Toro himself, King Oyo, who actually uh, made it uh, to the top of the mountain. And then, of course, uh, the other images show the mountain gorilla as well and, 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 and other unique features. Now let's talk about uh, the contribution of um, uh, tourism to Uganda's economy. And here I'm doing some bit of comparison for you to know, because you know, two years, three years ago, we had the COVID pandemic and it did have a disastrous effect in our industry. So I'll just be giving you a simple comparison here to see where we are standing right now. Uh, the contribution contribution of tourism to GDP was estimated at about 3.6%. Um, that is as of last year, 2022. And this was a sharp decline from 7.7% contribution way back in 2019, yeah? Then the Forex earnings as well dropped from 1.6 billion in 2019 uh, to 0.736 billion. That's about 700,000, you know, uh, 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 dollars in uh, 2022, which is a very, very sharp decline. Then of course, arrivals as well fell from almost 1.5 million to 814,000 uh, uh, tourists. Uh, domestic tourism, however, took another connotation whereby we saw domestic tourism actually uh, leap forward to 63.2% of the visitors uh, to the national parks. And this was uh, a steep rise from 34% in 2019. And this is all information according to our satellite account uh, that's managed by the, Uganda, uh, the Ministry of Tourism and UBOS. Then in terms of employment, Two out of every 10 Ugandans uh, are employed in the tourism and hospitality uh, sector along the entire value chain. So that is really uh, a great contribution and significant. Then um, tourism is um, a highly female dominated uh, industry with almost 68.3% being female employees. So that is uh, the, uh, the significance of tourism in as far as our economy and our country is concerned. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, those are just some of the images that show you uh, the domestic tourism uh, impact uh, so far in our, in our country. Now, um, allow me to take you through uh, the six A's that compose tourism promotion and development in totality. Now, these six A's, I would beg that we pay attention to them uh, in detail because all the opportunities are always embedded uh, within these six A's that define tourism and hospitality. And number one is the accommodation. And accommodation largely refers to places where people choose to stay, yeah? So people can choose to stay in hotels, in lodges, in homestays, in guest houses, name it, yeah? And that is one of the biggest components of tourism uh, that actually does, one, provide the biggest chunk of employment uh, to our people, but also, it is one that has the highest, takes the highest volume of expenditure in terms of a tourist budget and expenditure. 
Then number two, we have the attractions. Uh, these are basically uh, the unique uh, sites that people come to visit here. When you talk of the, the wildlife, you talk of the uh, of source of the Nile, you talk of the different attractions. So uh, that is the attraction bit. Then we have the amenities, yeah? Now, these are the amenities. These are uh, uh, services that facilitate uh, uh, tourism in a destination, yeah? For instance, you need the banks, yeah? You need the malls where people go shopping, uh, for instance, yeah? So you need the airports where, you know, people get into destinations. Uh, you need the, the, the airline companies and all that. So all those fall under amenities. Then of course we have accessibility. Uh, when any tourists in a destination, they need to move from one place to another. Yeah. So in terms of uh, accessibility, we have uh, the, 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 the road transports, we have the airlines, uh, there's supposed to be a functionable railway uh, uh, a facility, as well as taxis uh, that help us uh, to get from one place to another. Now, Uganda is unique because you even have the border borders as well. So these all fall within the uh, accessibility component. Then, of course, we have the activities. Yeah. And now these are, these are a, a, a range of uh, activities that um, normally are available uh, for, uh, uh, for visitors to partake while at a destination. These mainly are coined, they are normally come out of innovation. You've seen some water bikes, you've seen activities like quad bike, and activities like zip lining. So these are all um, innovations that come up to ensure that tourists enjoy their stay in a destination and that uh, we can benefit by manipulating our environment to come up with as many activities as possible. Then of course, um, we also have affordability that comes in uh, very handy. Um, no one wants a destination that is, you know, uh, a ripoff. Everyone wants a destination where there's value for money. And uh, uh, the more affordable you are, um, especially even in these hard economic times post pandemic, we need to have affordable uh, facilities. And that's why we added that affordability as the sixth component of tourism. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's just an example of the tourism roads that we have. Uh, this is in Southwest Uganda, and that is uh, uh, in Kisoro, yeah. Yes, so um, let's now delve into uh, the depth of our discussion, and that is regarding the low hanging fruits uh, that we have in tourism. First, we'll talk about uh, domestic tourism. And uh, domestic tourism has largely been uh, referred to as tourism that within our confines of our country, within our borders. And this is where the, uh, the locals um, normally move and enjoy uh, their destinations from one end to another. However, where is the low hanging fruit here? We have an opportunity, yeah, with the ESC integration, the East African community integration. We have an opportunity to expand our scope of domestic tourism to cover the rest of the East African community uh, states. East Africa combined today is having a population in excess of 250 million people. That's with addition of the Congo onto the block. Now we need to start thinking East African. Uh, we need to start uh, thinking um, uh, how we can tap into opportunities that are across the borders in Rwanda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, and then also working together to promote uh, intra East African travel. And this will give us a better market, a bigger market for uh, domestic tourism. And uh, this goes out for everyone who into operations, those who intend to start up, this is an opportunity to start thinking outward. Don't think of Uganda only in terms of uh, domestic tourism. It's now time to think uh, East Africa because there lies a big market. Then we need to um, as well uh, go into uh, niche tourism when it comes to uh, developing our products, yeah. You know, there are products that have been massively consumed and uh, they're massively known and they're shared across the, the, the divide. Now, if you talk of safari in Africa, you know, safari experiences straight down right from South Africa way to East Africa. So there's no clear point of distinction, yeah, because a lion is a lion, you know. And if somebody has seen lions in Masai Mara, why should they come to Uganda to, to specifically see lions again? So Uganda has to provide something more unique, something different. Uh, that will attract somebody to come visit here. We're blessed we have, yes, the mountain gorillas, but it should be more than that. We should redefine our cultural tourism. Uh, we should start having products that uh, are, are tourism ready. That's in the cultural space. And of course, uh, this will go back to the, to, to the kings and the kingdoms and, 
and the, the different communities uh, to come up with specific niche products in that line. Faith-based tourism is an opportunity here to ensure we turn Namugongo uh, matters experience into a year whole experience, not just tied to the, to, to the 3rd of June. You know, people should be able to make pilgrimages. Faithful should come from all over the world, you know, uh, to come and pay pilgrimage uh, to the Namugongo uh, matters shrine. And then we should be able to carve out an experience that keeps them here longer. Then of course, um, the other low hanging fruits are basically in uh, investment uh, in accommodation facilities. Um, many times people complain that going to the national parks is expensive and, and, and all that, especially the domestic uh, tourists. And to be honest, I must tell you that uh, the highest uh, uh, cause of those inflated rates for going on safari is the limited accommodation in the park. You find a park like Mach Machuan Falls uh, National Park, yeah? And it, within the park, you only find one budget accommodation or two, yeah? Like for instance, you have red chili and then you have the Uwa accommodation. Now these are, are, are the cheapest, yeah? But they also have limited rooms, you understand? So if you're to visit say uh, the National Park and those places are fully booked, you have to fork out in the excess of $280 to stay at Farah Safari Lodge. Now that makes it quite costly. So where does the opportunity come in here? We need to invest in accommodation on the peripherals of the park. If there is no uh, 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 concessions available in the park, we can invest in Masindi. We can put up lodges in Masindi. We put up lodges in Purongo on the boundaries of the park. Put up a lodge in Pakwach. You know, these are affordable accommodations, yeah, but on the boundaries of the park and you're still able to do the entire activity. So for Ugandans, for my colleagues who come from anywhere closer to the park, this is an opportunity because some of your villages are actually closer to the park. So you may not incur costs of high cost of acquisition of land and all that. Take advantage and invest. Then homestays are another uh, uh, opportunity that is out there yet to be tapped. And this is largely for communities. And uh, this can help also improve household, household incomes as well. Um, the other uh, opportunity we have is in terms of the, aux the auxiliary services that support uh, tourism, and that is transportation, uh, coffee shops. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Eddie, you're loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, if you would say traveling along the tourism highways, yeah, there's huge opportunity, immense opportunity, yeah, for one to be able to, um, to set up uh, an eat out, set up a place of, uh, you know, relaxation along uh, any of these highways, yeah. Uh, I singled out the Fort Porto route that there's hardly anywhere one can stop, except in Mubende at a petrol station. Now that is, you know, uh, an opportunity that goes begging. And I think uh, we need to think out loud on how best we can be able to set up uh, some of these additional services. Talk about coffee shops uh, in different uh, districts. When you go, at least places like Gulu now and other towns have come up with different coffee shops. But before it was very hard to find a very uh, high-end restaurant that would give one comfort. Um, the other uh, opportunity lies in, um, the area of tourism skills development. Uh, Belinda and colleagues will agree with me that we have an issue with professionalism in our sector. And this uh, uh, speaks to the quality of training that uh, we have, the institutions that we have. To be honest, they, are more, um, they have more work to do, yeah? Because tourism is international business, the standards are high. So we have opportunity here for people to set up uh, specialized courses, specialized that can train our human resource, yeah? So that's another opportunity. Then of course, when we go to technology and the markets, tourism marketing is on the internet today. Digital marketing is the in thing. And young people fresh from campus have the opportunity and the knowledge to come up with different applications uh, that can support businesses and of course create employment for uh, themselves. Yeah. Then of course, uh, the tourism, uh, not just talking about holding the steering wheel and driving, no. Having, being a tour guide, having an age in terms of uh, another national language that you can use, for example, a German tour guide, a Chinese tour guide, you know? So this is what sets you apart as a tour guide and can take you to the 
another level. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so those are just some of the images again uh, that show you the opportunities. You see our minister trying the coffee to cup experience. Um, so um, uh, in medical tourism, many people don't realize that when one travel, because when you travel, you travel with dependence. Yeah, you need to, um, buy food, for instance, yeah? You need to, uh, to rent a car, the main uh, hospital to get further tests in different parts of that area, wherever you've gone for treatment. Illnesses, especially orthopedic illnesses that require um, a lot of rehabilitation, yeah? So um, Belinda, can you hear me? I can hear you. Sometimes you go on and off, but yeah, you, you're there. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So when you talk of medical tourism, uh, there's immense opportunity uh, as well uh, for, for us uh, here as Ugandans to tap into. Um, one, you'll know that Mulago is the biggest neonatal hospital currently in our East African uh, community destination. So meaning many mothers from neighboring countries, from Sudan, from uh, Rwanda, from um, even Kenya, crossing borders to come for specialized treatment in Mulago. Now, this doesn't only bring income, Forex to Mulago or the government, yeah? But we as well have a duty to position ourselves, yeah? To tap into what other services can we extend to such travelers, yeah? We have the pediatric hospital that has recently been opened in Entebbe. It's the one and only uh, pediatric hospital of the kind in the Eastern and Central African region again. We are having so many Congolese going to this hospital, so many uh, Sudanese coming into this hospital for treatment. And these normally spend not less than three weeks within uh, the destination. How prepared are we? This is time to open up and start thinking why, yeah? Have the orthopedic hospital broken a bone, you can never know how important that orthopedic hospital is. But when you travel to Kumi uh, for treatment, if you're not confined within the hospital, is within Kumi town itself, talk of distant accommodation for a few nights before you're admitted into the hospital, these are opportunities. Talk of the eye hospital in Tororo, how many people know about it? So many visitors traveling in different parts of Uganda heading. How has this impacted? on the communities around, the nature of accommodation around. Natural tourism, how prepared are our kingdoms? You see, most of our kingdoms, uh, uh, cultural institutions are being known for, you know, pestering government for support. And yet these are the centers yeah, of uh, history, rich, rich, rich history. Yeah, that just needs to be profiled. We need to just have simple museums in these kings and palaces that uh, we have here today. And then they'll be cashing in uh, top dollar from different tourists that are visiting. Have we tapped into that? Yes, Uganda Kingdom has tried, but they also still have more work to do in terms of putting up good museums. The Chabazinga has to do the same and so should the rest of the other kingdoms uh, do. So that is huge opportunity. Now, when we talk about content development, again, this is one specific for the young people. Many of us have a lot of devices on our hands. How are we using them? Yeah, we have skills in terms of photography. There's a young man called Derek. Derek started with, a, you know, moving around, providing free services. Today, he's earning big from uh, photography, videography, travel writing. Many companies are looking for people who can write good articles, yeah, to help them in their online marketing. Yeah, have we tapped into this as young people? These are things we need to look at because they'll create bread and butter for you at the end of the day. Now, when we talk of agro-tourism, that's another area. Uganda is known to be the food basket, very arable land. 90% of the land is arable. So many farms lying idle out there in the countryside. Have we thought about farm tours? Have we thought about putting up some bit of homestays within the farm? Farm lodges, you know? These are all uh, opportunities for experiential tourism uh, that exists in, the, in that space. Marine tourism, 
Yeah, right now going to Kalangala, you only have two uh, providers that are actually tourist standard like, you know, you're talking of MV Bad and MV Vanessa. And out of that, MV Kalangala, to be honest, is not really up to standard. So this provides an opportunity. Yeah, can you partner? Can you seek investors to work with you? Set up marine transportation. Yeah, set up um, you know some floating restaurants. You know, and these are all opportunities that still lie idle on Lake Victoria. And uh, there is one young man in Ginger, Adam, who started up the floating business, the tubing. Doing they're, they're really uh, benefiting. So this is an invitation again to all of us. That we can fit in the value chain. We talk of edu tourism, and this is uh, largely to do with students who move across the borders uh, to come here in the country. This bring in foreign exchange uh, as, as they are seeking uh, better education uh, from our country. So that's another area in terms of accommodations that you can put up close to universities. You know how many students are going to Busitema University currently, but where can they stay when they're in Busitema if the accommodation is full in the university hostels? Yeah, there is no other accommodation in the vicinity, large chunks of land uh, falling idle. So we need to start thinking out loud. And uh, this is an opportunity as well. Then, of course, the arts and crafts, uh, these are mainly for the informal sector, for our old uh, women out there, our mothers who are out there never had a good education, but they have skills with their hands, make up very good marks and souvenirs. That's an opportunity. Then uh, lastly, it's the mice, and that is the uh, mice is the things, incentives, Mice in a nutshell is business tourism as opposed to leisure tourism. You know, many people think of uh, tourism as only leisure, but it's also business tourism. And these are people who think so maybe a three day meeting, but they have opportunity to spend more than uh, just um, the time spent in the meeting room. For example, I could have a workshop in Munyonyo for two days and have one day off to go and see the source of the Nile. So that's another catching point uh, that we need to be able to position for uh, to start thinking out why. If there's a big meeting, now we have the NAM, the NAM non-aligned movement coming up next year. We have the G77. How have you positioned yourself? Do you have products that are, 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 are not just the one week packages? Do you have packages for one day, for two days that somebody can engage in? At the end of the day, they spend $100, $200. That makes a difference in your business. Okay. Who are you to have so 200,000 or 250,000 at the end of the day? So this is a call again for us in the business currently to think out why and have products that, uh, that can uh, 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 benefit everybody. Then of course, uh, this is, that is Derek I told you about, uh, the young man making it out in photography. This is tobio.com. Again, young people who have come up with apps that help to support the sector and the earning. And then of course, a Yalama, you know, and that is who we are you know, in that space as well, uh, providing a tour and uh, travel services. Um, as I conclude uh, on the last slide, and again, I just want to thank Enterprise Uganda. Um, uh, thank you, Belinda, our host, and, uh, and, and, and the entire team for giving us an opportunity again, and uh, to thank you, the listeners, for taking in keen interest and being here to listen to this discussion. And I urge you all to take opportunities uh, seriously, tap into the available opportunities uh, in our industry, and together we can grow our tourism uh, to a better place. Asante Sana, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Eddie. You are addressing a sector that is very close to my heart, and, and it puts a smile on my face to see you explain all these things to us. And personally, I see where the money is. Okay, I see where the money is. And we all don't have to do one thing. There's so many things that we can do. So thank you for the presentation. And we thank, Inter um, we thank Uganda Tourism Board for leading um, on the management of this brand. At least we now have the same voice. We are communicating the same thing. And now you're coming out to the business community and inviting us to partner with UTB so that we can make some money. I like the fact that people spend at least three days in Uganda. And while they're here, they're eating, they're traveling, and they can do some shopping as well. So um, we have a group of about 70 people, Eddie. I'm going to invite questions now, but my first question to you, Eddie, is 
show me where the money is. Eh? If we have young people or um, business, I want you to show me where the money is. You tell me if I go to the, the region of where Queen Elizabeth National Park is, you tell me if I set up a restaurant, if I set up a craft shop at this place, I have an exposure to X number of tourists in these um, months in the year. I want someone to walk away from this presentation if they had 10 million shillings knowing where they are going to put it. Can we have some spot on um, examples of business opportunities that we can walk away with from the many attractions we have in our country? Let's even start with Kampala because most people come to Kampala or even in Tebe where everybody lands. Let's try to spot, um, uh, spotlight some business opportunities, Eddie. Yes. Um... Thank you, Belinda. You want us to do it? Uh, do you want us to just take the different, or we can do it back and forth as a discussion? We can do it back and forth. So, take it back. yes, because now we've talked about it in a big picture. This is a business community. They have their money. Maybe they want to diversify. I like the fact that you said maybe there's no stopover in Port Porto. Maybe Port Porto is too far away from us. Let's start with Kampala. Let's start with the national parks. What can I do with my 10 million shillings, with my 5 million shillings to be able to benefit from the many people that visit our country? So where is the money? <laughs> where is the money? Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Belinda, and our listeners. Um, I'm going to come to that question uh, of where is the money, but one thing I always try to advise uh, startups, in most cases, um, those who are interested in getting into tourism, that even before you think about the money, first get the passion for the business, first get the passion for the industry, because when you're monitor when you're money driven, there are times when the money is not going to come through. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, because tourism is a very seasonal business. Now, there are times when the money is not going, maybe your strategy wasn't right, in the wrong uh, 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 part of the value chain. So there's so many, what is going to keep you stuck in the game? That is going to be passion for the industry, passion for tourism. You get it. So once you've developed that and your vision is clear that you want to build a generational business in tourism, yeah, then now you can start laying down uh, your strategies and knowing uh, where to put. Now, um, just to put on your question, and um, I'm not going to give you all the opportunities, but I'll just single out one, two, three opportunities. Tourism is on a step on a steep rise. Yeah. 64%, 68% of the visitor last year in the parks and protected areas were domestic tourists. Now you don't take that for land, uh, for granted. That is an indicator for an investor. Yeah, that money is moving and it's local and it's there throughout the year. Domestic tourists, where did they go to? They went to the islands. When you look at uh the islands on a weekend. Majority of these hotels are fully booked. For the next three weekends, they have no availability. When you call Victoria uh, a Resort in Sese, the next two weekends, they have no availability. This is an indicator for you as an investor. Somebody who wants where the money is, go down there, set up a small facility. It could even be a beach house, you know, that takes up uh, just uh, four or five rooms or a family. Yeah, you will cash in money because there is shortage of accommodation. Two, for our friends uh, who come from uh, Kidepo area, yeah, uh, Kidepo is one area where there's huge opportunity for budget accommodation. Yeah, because if you're not staying at Apoka Bandas within the park, where else are you going to get a room of 200,000 shillings, a room of 250,000 shillings? It's not there. Yeah, so. Can you use the opportunities? Can you use the contacts you have? How you venture, how you penetrate that accommodation market uh, in Kidepo, uh, for instance. Then, of course, I already talked about the highways and opportunities for uh, setting up 
different highways. Uh, this is another opportunity that they are begging, and uh, it's something that our people need to uh, uh, tap into. Now, Bina is another opportunity that is normally for, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the females, I must say, and is largely to do with the, with the arts and crafts and souvenir shops at different hotels. Now, if you move into very many hotels here in Kampala, they normally have uh, the reception there, the concierge, but there's always a room that seems unoccupied and empty. And there's nowhere somebody can buy a quick souvenir. Yeah, these guys are waiting for you to walk in there and ask for that space. That space may not even be paid for in terms of uh, rental, but you could propose something like a cost uh, profit sharing kind of scheme uh, with them, with the hotel, because this is added revenue. So if you went into um, a number of hotels, this opportunity is out there with 5 million shillings, as you said, uh, Belinda, you go and shop your, your arts and crafts on Buganda Road, take them to a different good to go. Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of business, the other opportunity exists in terms of uh, supplies. Supplies the different hotel uh, vegetables could be in terms of fruits, could be in terms of uh, fresh juices, could be in terms of supplying coffee. You know, very many people have gone into coffee packaging. You know, yeah, you know, just one contact can get you a business deal of a lifetime. You know, if, for example, owner of hotel, you can be given a contract to supply uh, coffee, you know, ground coffee. So uh, 50 kilograms per week, and that is huge money in terms of uh, supplies. So offhead, uh, Belinda, those are some of the opportunities that are out there uh, that people should think about. Then lastly, of course, when it comes to agro-tourism and the farm lodges, how many of us have very nice, beautiful houses sitting idle in our homes, in our villages, in our farms, as we're here in Kampala. Eight months of the year, the house is unoccupied. It's empty, beautiful house, state of the art, huge compound, five bedrooms, untapped, fully furnished. So how many of us have opened up these to tourists to tap into and use them for an extra buck, an extra dollar? So Belinda, these are some of the few ideas that I can come, I think of right now that we can tap in and, uh, and earn that extra dollar. Hey, thank you, Eddie. My, my thoughts are that any place that people visit in big numbers presents so many opportunities for, for business. If people are going for leisure, they're going to drink, they're going to eat food, they will want souvenirs, they will want to play, they'll want to do so many activities. So I think we, we need to think about the traffic we are having to our um, attractions and see how each one of us can benefit. And well, all of us might not be able to build lodges, but there's, there's so many things that business, I mean, tourists do while they are on tour that can help us uh, make some money. Emmanuel, your hand is up. Emmanuel, your hand is up. Okay, we had a comment in. Yes, Emmanuel. Yes, thank you, Belinda. Thank you uh, to the presenter, uh, Uganda Tourism Board. Uh, you have painted a very good picture of tourism, but um, as you know, Ugandans, uh, we are domestic tourism actually is still very low because Ugandans are still, majority are still living hand to mouth. And thus, we are mostly targeting uh, the foreigners. Who for, which foreigners um, are very risk uh, averse, I should say. Whenever they hear any issues um, um, of terrorism or issues in cases, abduction, uh, ADF, things like that, they run away. Can you speak to some of uh, the ways the Uganda Tourism Board has responded to these uh, threats? that are uh, outside of Uganda's control, but many times are actually keeping the tourism away, the tourists. Because Amos Lukes has said many times that most of our news headlines actually scare away the tourism, uh, the tourists. This is supposed to be our peak season, but many tourists are not coming in. How do you address that? And of course, as an insurer, I have to talk about that. Um, insurance can be one of the solutions to 
respond to some of those uh, tourists, you know? So, Kankuma, Michael, thank you so much. Emmanuel Safari here. Yes, Emmanuel, thank you so much. Um, Charles? Charles, your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you, Belinda, and uh, thank you, uh, our brother, for a very elaborate explanation. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask one question about the kind of support system that Uganda Tourist Board can give Ugandans who are interested in such investments. For example, uh, I do three things. I have a small guest house in a small town called Nebi in West Nile, which is about 30 minutes drive to Massachusetts Falls. At times I get some few people. Now I intend to do some expansion, for example, have a 10 acre piece of land within the municipality where we want to do agro tourism. I'm trying to put some few things which can attract people. We can also use it for training in the government process of PDM and this, these things, but there's a component of cottages which we want to put in there. Now, we lack where to go to get good advice like you have given us today. Is there some component of a support system in terms of advice? And maybe also in terms of support in financing and the equipments which we can get at a better price in order to promote tourism. Thank you uh, so much. Okay, thank you, Charles. Um, Eddie, let's 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 do, let's handle those two questions, and then we'll take others. Thank you Eddie? very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Belinda. Thank you very much, Emmanuel and uh, Charles. And um, uh, beginning with Emmanuel, uh, one Emmanuel, I, I concur with you that uh, uh, the incomes of our domestic travelers um, uh, are not yet out there. Many are still living uh, hand to mouth. But also the opportunity in there uh, is that tourism now is, has a broader kind of understanding. Uh, uh, the, the, the conception of tourism now goes beyond uh, spending a night over at a specific location. We have now excursions, we have day trips, we have, you know, if you and your family just went to the beach in Entebbe, yeah, and spent there half a day, you know, um, that is regarded as domestic tourism uh, as well. So I think it should be the understanding of how, what do we define tourism to be? You know, um, every weekend uh, people are traveling out of the country, uh, out of the, to the countryside to go for barriers, to go for marriage ceremonies. And along the way, you're passing so many attractions. You're passing by the equator. You're passing by the rhino sanctuary at Ziwa as you're going to Gulu. You're passing by um, a ginger as you're going to the Eastern part of the country, you know? These are all in uh, a budget uh, to be able to visit some of these places. So I think it's a domestic tourism is one of the best solutions to uh, uh, that high, 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 high risk uh, market uh, that you clearly stated, the foreign market being very high risk and volatile and fragile because of uh, the different negative advisories and, uh, and, and and of course the bad PR goes. So domestic tourism still remains our best shot uh, to be able to sustain one, our businesses for us who have invested, but also uh, two, to ensure that all those along the value chain, <coughs> excuse me, still earn from the, <coughs> excuse me, still earn from the industry. So um, in terms of what are we doing as a tourism board? We've engaged uh, <clears throat> the Ministry of Ice, the different arms of government, including the, uh, <clears throat> the in terms of how fast we respond uh, in case of any <clears throat> uh, uh, disaster, in case of any, uh, say, pandemic, we're in touch now with the Ministry of Health to ensure that we have rapid response. Hello. Uh, the yeah. uh, for instance, you, 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 you have a pandemic that has hit, uh, has hit the country. It's true, the pandemic is there, it won't go away, and you don't lie about it. 
Yeah. So uh, in such scenarios, the best thing to do is to make sure there's synchronized flow of information in a timely manner, you know, that gives confidence uh, of uh, the international community that we are handling the situation and it's under control. So that kind of messaging uh, is very key. And we are also building um, uh, onto our PR unit as well. Uh, we have uh, support uh, PR units from uh, different firms uh, that are supporting our department at UTB to ensure that we counter uh, such uh, uh, incidences in a very timely manner in as far as communication uh, is concerned. Now, uh, going to Charles' is, um, uh, uh, scenario. Charles, thank you very much for first and foremost taking this step uh, to invest uh, in the industry, a guest house in Nebi uh, within the town is one such investment uh, that supports the tourism uh, sector in general. You're not just making money out of it, but you're extending a service to any of us, to me, to Belinda, who might travel to maybe soon, and we want a decent place to stay, a decent uh, place to eat. So thank you very much for that. Now, Charles, you said you have a 10 acre piece of land and you need uh, support in terms of knowledge. Uh, and- uh, You're from, which is your, what is your small, what is your village? Hello? Hello, Belinda, are we? Eddie, are we I can hear you. Keep going. Keep going, oh, Eddie. Some, some mm. Yeah. So I think that uh, as a 10 acre piece of land uh, in municipality in Nebi, and uh, they want to set up some cottages and also uh, some facilities to support PDM and, and all that. Charles, um, we have a production, a product development and investment officer uh, stationed at UTB. And anytime you walk in, you'll be given audience yeah, on um, <clears throat> how to go about uh, investing in that area. Financing, because UDP, Uganda Development Bank, does have a facility, uh, a credit facility for the hospitality sector, tourism sector. So this information will be readily available uh, to you once you can always knock on our doors. However, uh, from a personal uh, experience, if advised us to show to show to show you where the money is eh? the ready money that 10 acre in the municipality uh, my brother in Nebi me I would think uh, that this tourist in perspective here now these are people who are bringing meetings to Nebi mm -hmm. have meeting places meeting spaces in Nebi decent facilities for meetings meeting halls meeting rooms yeah large restaurants yeah, that can handle bank banqueting for a large group of 100 into the accommodation. That is a low hanging fruit, yeah. Many districts are concentrating on small lodges and rooms, but many people don't realize that there's too much budget, too much money in government in as far as meeting spaces are concerned. The NGO communities are looking for meeting places on a daily basis. Now, if you put up your very nice meeting facility, yeah, 100 seater, you get it, with an adjacent restaurant. Nice, beautiful gardens outside. Trust me, uh, my brother Charles, you'll never go hungry because that budget is already there. There are meetings that are destined for Nebi, year in, year out. So it is something uh, food for thought you should think about even before you go on to add on extra accommodation facilities. So this is just uh, a tip of the iceberg, but there's more, uh, if you can knock on our doors at the, UT, at the UTP offices, I will be able to engage and interact further. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Eddie. You are going to provide for us the contacts um, of the people we need to contact at UTB. And as well as, as you were responding to the question, Emmanuel's question about our coverage, our, our press coverage, and just how risky and volatile the tourism sector is. I am reminded that we are all responsible for protecting destination Uganda. And actually that is why we started the Ondava campaign. Sometimes we get onto social media and we become very irresponsible and we share information that scares people away. They, they make, they make, they make, they make our, um, Uganda look like a very toxic destination, which is far from the truth, okay? In spite of all the scares we've had in the past, there are still people who are brave enough to come and visit 
destination Uganda. So as we choose to, the more people we have invested in tourism, the more we'll have an or maybe um, encouragement to protect by what we share on 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 our social our social media. And yes, we also do have some questions or responses in the chat. John Mbonye is saying, souvenir makers in Uganda make generally big and heavy items, but travelers want light and small. So a guide, guidance is not adequate. And then someone responded and said, Christina Kadama said, there's a group of widowed ladies making very light baskets and they're just looking for markets and that there is the contact of the widowed ladies we can reach out to them and waja is saying thanks for the presentation where is the money indeed for example what is the current hotel lodge and airbnb occupancy rate in major cities in kampala or are the Uganda Airbnb rates competitive enough? Someone mentioned to me that Airbnb rates in Uganda are so low. Is that true? Those kinds of statistics will be helpful to guide potential investors in the sector. Eddie, you will share with us if you have any information about the accommodation rates for hotels in Kampala and also for Airbnb occupancy. And then we have... Uh, dear Belinda, Eddie did answer my question. Ketson point, how did UTB respond to restoring tourist confidence when a tourist was abducted and killed at Windy National Park? I think he did say that they, they do have a measure of responding to all these um, situations. If it's a health issue, they work with the Ministry of Health. If it's a security issue, I think they work with the chosen or the relevant agencies. Okay, if you need him to explain further, uh, I'm sure he'll be able to do that. Now, Eddie, let's talk about these rates. Um, Airbnb, you seem to be saying that if I have my country in Barra, so a country home in Barra, if it is uh, vacant throughout the, the, the year, I could use it as an Airbnb occupancy. Do you have statistics? Uh, do you have prices that you think are competitive enough for people to get an idea to take advantage of that low hanging fruit? Eddie? I thank you very much, uh, Belinda, again. And uh, uh, the question of rates, yeah, uh, is one that uh, varies uh, uh, greatly from uh, uh, one location uh, to another. For instance, uh, rates in Kampala, are not the same rates in the in the protected areas, are not the same rates in Masindi, are not the same rates in uh, uh, other parts of the country. Yeah, so that is um, one area that really uh, is very, what, what I can say, volatile. And also some properties do not keep a static rate. Yeah, in high season, you realize that the rates will go up. Sometimes they even double, yeah, when the season is high. And when we're talking of high season, uh, Belinda, you rightly said at the beginning that we are already in high season now. The stretches all the way from June to September. So with rates within that 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 time period tend to go higher than rates uh, between the months of March, April, and May. Rates in uh, December, yeah, to January are always much higher than the rates from October to uh, uh, to November. Now, what would I advise uh, somebody who is looking at uh, investing? in say the accommodation segment or, or into an A or B2B uh, uh, segment, yeah? When I was starting um, my journey in tourism, I was blessed to have attended the graduate entrepreneurship program by Charles Ochichi and Enterprise Uganda. Mm -hmm. One thing in my head in 2007 and it will never leave and that was a phenomenon described as analysis paralysis. <laughs> when you analyze an idea and you want to know what your competitor is charging before you go down and put an investment and you over go into in-depth to get all the nitty gritty of statistics, you'll never get started, I'm afraid. Because mm -hmm. the figures you're going to find out there, one, and do not represent uh, uh, necessarily value for money, no. Sometimes they're based on feelings of the owner of the facility. I could set up my, my, my nice looking Airbnb in Garuga 
and I say I'm not taking less than $200, and no one will take me to court for that because it's based on my feeling, okay? However, you have a need, and that need is pushing you to invest an Airbnb. It's pushing you to turn your house in the village into a home state. It's pushing you to turn your property in the city or near Namgongo, yeah, into a, a, a home state when June comes. Your need should inform your pricing. And that's what I keep telling most uh, entrepreneurs who want to invest in accommodation. You don't have to, there's no one size fits all. You don't have to put an accommodation next door and they're charging $100. It's not written anywhere. You should go and charge $100 as well. No, you could actually put up a better facility and charge $60 a night. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you'll have the numbers. You'll have the high turnover at the end of the month and you walk to the bank smiling. So for me, the discussion on rates should be should not be like an issue that should impede anybody from putting down uh, their investment in sector in accommodation. What I would advise you to do is just to do a basic business plan, okay? Do a basic business plan, do some anecdotal surveys on the internet, go to bookings.com, just look through and see, get a feel of, of, of what uh, the charges are like and then find your unique entry point. If everyone is charging in Masindi, for instance, if everyone is charging for their accommodation uh, $100 to $150, yeah, you can choose to come in depending on your strengths and your, advantage, your, your unique selling point. You can come in with an accommodation of $70, but providing a service that is commensurate, that is equivalent to what these guys are offering to establishment. So I think if we should open up our minds. We should be more unique in our thinking and not try to think like everyone else, yeah? Let's be entry point and your competitive advantage, then you need to enter in uh, with that uh, dimension. But my humble request is that if you're ready and willing to invest in this, in this business, you need to take time, uh, get general information. Don't go so much into the specific of how my who is charging what, no because that may mislead you and may impede you from nurturing your good idea that uh, would be of great benefit to you in future and generations to come after you, only because you got scared of pricing uh, and all that. Belinda, I hope I've tried to, uh, to respond to that. Hello? 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 Okay. Eddie? Yes, did, 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 did you lose me? Uh, not really for a minute, but yeah, we, we got you there on the issue of the race. Yeah. Okay, so... Basically, there is no standard rate. It's really, it really depends on your investment and also what you are offering as a product, right? Exactly. Not all exactly. accommodation is the same. Exactly. If I told you that it's a standard rate and pricing, that would be very misleading. So yeah. I would really encourage people to be original in their thinking. Yeah. Walk your own way, create your own course and run it and be used as a benchmark, be used by, as a case study by other people but don't try to follow everyone's path. Okay, thank you. Eddie, I like that in your presentation, you were talking about young people and the opportunities for them. I hear you talking about startups. I hear you talking about um, photography, things that young people can do when they have just left the university to be able to join the tourism sector. So can you please speak to us more about what MTD is doing to encourage young people? join the tourism sector. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Belinda. Uh, as, as I said again, that the opportunities for young people are immense, and these are largely drawn uh, from, uh, from, their, from their character, first of all, as young people, because they're so tech savvy from their knowledge, because most of them are access to computers, the generation today and the generation in yesteryears are so different. 
yeah, in as far as uh, the use of computers are, are concerned, yeah. And two, they are so adventurous, meaning uh, that they have so many options uh, on their hands. Again, I'll bring you another example from that encounter with, uh, with Enterprise Uganda and Charles Ochichi. You know, he, he, one thing that uh, made me actually uh, stop working uh, for more employment uh, way back in 2007 was when uh, Ochichi told us that uh, uh, he defined the word job to mean uh, being just over broke, yeah? Employment. Again, I'm not saying former employment is bad, but that is what literally it comes down to. You're always of just being over, over. So that is one of the inspirations that for me coming out of university because I graduated my first degree in 2005. So that is one of the things that made me go into entrepreneurship. Two, uh, he did tell us as a young person, the room and the liberty to make as many mistakes as possible you know, in terms of your entrepreneurial journey. Meaning you can invest small and scratched, yeah? Because the level of dependence around you is so minimal. You have no children yet at that age as a young person. You have no wife, you have no family commitments and all that. So at the end of the day, you have room to play around with business ideas. Now for the young people specifically, IT is one of those areas that a young person should really find space in the tourism value chain. Developing apps, mobile apps today, because mobile apps are fast replacing websites. Yeah, One, because whoever downloads your app can use it, access it offline and access your information offline. That's one advantage. And those who have invested in that space, to be honest, they have a bigger future to think about. Now, when you go into uh, digital marketing, today tourism is being marketed online. Yeah. Many young people have so many social media handles that they're only using to, uh, to comment on different topics, politics, and all that kind of thing. But however, if you turned uh, your and grew your audience on your handle, yeah, that handle alone could be a source of revenue if you chose to be an online influencer, for instance, yeah, and post people's products there, post people's services there in exchange for income. That is something that a young person can do just with a phone in their hands. Then when you go to certain um, services like website design and, and, and blogging, blogging, not everyone who is in um, 40 years plus knows what to do with a blog or has the writing skills or the patient to even type a 1000 uh, word uh, script, no. But a young person with their phone, they can sit down, type a blog of 1000 words and at the end of the day, they are paid 20,000 shillings for every blog they write. Now that is money that would otherwise have not come into their pockets. So in terms of young people, yes, IT is, uh, is the way to go. For me, that's the lowest hanging fruit uh, for young person. One, little investment required. You already have a mobile handset, you have a smartphone, you're only good to go, yeah? Two, uh, and as far as the Uganda Tourism Board is concerned, Linda, you asked what have we done? One, we've, uh, we're in the process of setting up uh, a digital hub. Now, this digital hub is going to uh, power our operations, our digital marketing efforts in the digital space, yeah? Now, in this hub, we are going to bring on board uh, young people who are going to be sourced from different universities, yeah? Uh, best performers and all that, to come and do innovate, to come and innovate ways of destination marketing uh, that, you know, will be able to, uh, to, to, to build into our mandate as an institution. So these are opportunities that we are, we are going to start churning out and we're already in touch with several universities. We are in touch with Huawei Technologies because they also have a pool of young graduates uh, whom they induct. So these are opportunities that we are going to be extending out because we want uh, to, to provide more opportunity uh, for our young people and for the graduates out there. So many of the young people on this forum right now should look out for uh, such information on the UTB handles, on the UTB websites. Uh, soon you'll be seeing uh, a call uh, for those interested. And of course, uh, this will, will be um, accompanied, of course, with some bit of pay, and this will create more networks and opportunities for young people. Uh, Belinda, uh, that's what I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. Now, as you are talking about young people, I'm thinking about the other opportunity of our food, and our culture, our food in the sense of the wide 
variety, the white spectrum of our food, our fruits, our vegetables, our traditional food. And then, of course, our culture, like our music, our nightlife, and, and, and the things that make us unique socially. Um, are there opportunities that you can highlight for us that we can all benefit from as far as our food and culture is concerned? Apart from the museums that everybody has set up, but at that level of um, of culinary delight and also um, fashion, um, how we play, our games are quite intriguing. Talk to us about that. I believe I did. I did pick the last the last bit. Just uh, repeat the last bit uh, that you just said. Um, so what I, I was just summarizing my question to say, talk to us about any initiatives that UTB has put in place to allow people to explore our food, our culture, our fashion, and our recreation, if I can say, our social oh. aspect of life. Yes. Okay, uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Belinda. Um, food tourism or gastronomy, as we normally uh, refer to it, is one of those unique selling points, yeah, of a tourism destination like, like Uganda. Uh, friends who are listening in, uh, if you have traveled outside this country, you will realize how blessed we are in terms of our cuisine. And not just the cuisine, availability of plenty of food, yeah? If you only crossed the border here and went down to Tanzania, yeah? And uh, you... Why? Because of the limited uh, food varieties uh, that are out there. You're going to a special dish called makanki from Monday to Friday, and you'll wonder whether you had a contract with a dish called makanki because their meals are limited. Yeah, in that. If you go to Kenya here, that Nyamachoma and Ugali, it's like the thing all over the place, all over the place. Yes, it's their unique identity in terms of that food, but everyone who travels wants to explore variety. Yeah. Now that is a blessing that we have as a country. Yeah. That we need to start taking pride, okay, in our delicacies because they are unique. You know, as I said earlier, that we have over 65 tribes and we are the fourth most, most culturally diverse country in the world. That means that every 100 kilometers or 50 kilometers you move in our country, you're going to find a different food, a kind of food that is unique to that area. Yeah, you leave Buganda, leave the Toke here and the Chinewa and start traveling up north. The moment you, you, you hit Kigumba like this, you're already talking about a different kind of uh, food setting. By the time you reach Guru, eh? Kalo has taken over, uh, uh, La Pena has taken over, you know? So it's all different and unique. But what we need to do, uh, in my view, to tap into this, one, we need to first appreciate that we are unique, okay? We need to appreciate that any visitor who comes in here wants to feel local. They want to feel the local dish. They want to feel the uniqueness of Uganda. And that means that if you own a restaurant, if you own a hotel, how diverse is your menu? Yeah? What business do you have with preparing burgers eh? in a guest house eh? down in Tororo or in Gulu? And yet the largest uh, 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 percentage of your visitors who are coming, transiting to keep Americans or they are there. These guys are traveling because they want to feel local. They want to understand the local tech, local delicacies. So let's have a fair share of representation in your menu. Okay, if you want to keep the fast food burgers, yes, keep them, it doesn't hurt, but also have a section that has the local delicacies. Okay, and clearly have some bit of imagery represent what delicacy looks like. Then number two uh, should be, we should explore ways of food preparation that can bring out a local delicacy in a timely manner. Because for instance, if I, uh, Luombo, eh, if I, 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 I'm a foreign and I wanted to taste Luombo of meat and dinners, I do not have the luxury of four hours to sit there and what comes back upon you, the owner of the tourism facility to be 
tourism ready, to become tourist ready in as far as your delicacies are concerned. Innovate ways these meals and only require about 10, 20 minutes to full production when a guest is ready sitting in a, in a restaurant, because that is the biggest challenge. Like when you walk into a restaurant and you only find that you can only have lunch, local lunch between midday and 2 p.m. after that it's shut. To be honest, it's not just shut for you, but it's shut for uh, everyone else who would have benefited from this service. But even you, you've limited your income of the to only two hours. So we need to innovate and then be able to, uh, uh, to service that market uh, for the food tourism. Again, one, you need to look around yourself. Don't look far from yourself because you need to provide a service along the value chain that you're comfortable with. So if food is your unique advantage, if you have an age in that area, again, look around yourself, look around the personnel you have, look around the money you have, and then you can be able uh, to set yourself uh, properly and position yourself strategically to tap into the food tourism market. But gastronomy is a unique selling point for us as a country because we are normally referred to as the food basket of East Africa. So we need to tap into that. You know, tourism uh, and our brand specifically, Belinda, that we coined, the Explore Uganda, uh, the Pearl of Africa. The, our call, our, our, our brand promise, you know, in itself is to speak to the traveler and not just the tourist. The difference between a tourist and a traveler is that the tourist is a destination with a specific box to tick. They come to Uganda specifically around mountain gorillas. They go to Paris specifically to see the Eiffel Tower. They go to, uh, to, 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 to Egypt specifically to see the pyramid, you know, and that is the tourist. Now, us, our strategy and our, our, our key goal is not to target the tourist, no it is to target the traveler. Now, the traveler is somebody who goes just beyond seeing the iconic marks, but goes depth to understand the destination in totality. Yeah, meaning they want to explore your food. They want to explore your culture. They want to go and attend a local marriage ceremony. They want to, to just feel, stop by the roadside and talk to a stranger, you know? These are people who feel comfortable by near walking out of the airport at Entebbe and they just enjoy the sun and they just walk into the now that is the client we are looking for out there, you know. Um, who stays longer? This is a client who stays at least average 10 to 15 days in a destination. They live more, they spend more, and at the end of the day, they can see every and every pocket of this uh, of this country. And that means even the lowest uh, person in the grass to test the dollar of, of, of the tourists. So uh, food is the lowest hanging fruit uh, for any community uh, lodge, for any community out there. I think that's what I have to share. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. I like, I like what you said about being tourism ready. That's, that's a new one I've, I've learned today. It summarizes everything that we try to do to preserve this industry to understand the needs of our, our visitors, how long they spend, how much they spend. That is all being tourism ready. And when it comes to the food, yes, we can introduce our foods to them. I mean, when you go to Italy, they'll give you all these kinds of food that you've never tasted. And because you're on an adventure, you're exploring, you'll be able to taste our food. And many people have not regretted that. Thank you so much, Eddie, for sharing. We've had a fantastic one hour and a couple of minutes with you. And I think we're coming towards the end. Thank you so much, Eddie, for sharing with us. You did promise us some contacts. Uh, as you could be put them in the chat, your contact as well. And um, if we do not have any more, or oh, we had we had some, um, we have some feedback in the chat. Uh, people really just giving you kudos, Eddie, for your presentation. Fantastic presentation covering not only tourism, but even other investment ventures, homestays in those idolized homes in those villages is a great idea to pick on. Thank you so much, Eddie and Belinda. You're very welcome, John Mbonye. Then uh, Mantongo Josephine says, very good presentation. You've opened my eyes on domestic tourism. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and Enterprise Uganda. It's a pleasure, Josephine. And yeah, someone is 
getting hungry very early, talking about obo at this time when you are talking about food. Um, ready. Uh, very nice presentation from everybody. Thank you too for listening in this Thursday morning. About 10 minutes to the end of the show, Eddie is going to share with us contacts that we can use to get in touch with UTB. Eddie is going to share his contacts as well. And I think it's time for us to say goodbye right now. Eddie, we want to thank you so much. Greet everybody at Uganda Tourism Board, Lily and the team. You're doing a great job to promote Destination Uganda, and we really, really appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Eddie, you can give your parting shots, actually. Give your parting shots. Uh, you know, uh, Belinda, I just want to say uh, thank you to Enterprise Uganda, because um, at the end of the day, if they don't create this platform uh, for people like us, who are um, both uh, private sector and also public sector uh, at the same time, we never get a chance to, uh, to share with the publics never get a chance to share with Ugandans to encourage uh, them about business because as we are living testimonies who started businesses from scratch I think today I'm among those uh, uh, silent case studies that enterprise Uganda does have of people who are present I didn't expect that uh, one day I'll be a board member at the Uganda Tourism Board of the industry representing the interests of the entire private sector. I didn't know, but it's because of the experiences that I've garnered all through uh, my journey uh, uh, in, in tourism and hospitality that today I can literally sit and discuss tourism the whole day and lift up somebody's spirit, give somebody a new idea that they never thought for the next Uganda uh, for this opportunity. And we hope it won't be the last one. And also for moderators like Belinda, who really have a passion for, uh, for Uganda. And I love what you say that it's the duty of every Ugandan to showcase Uganda because tourism is sitting in an office here in, uh, in Kampala. Uh, you enjoy a good salary for your cousins uh, or your mom or your dad is directly benefiting from the tourism value chain because they have to take vegetables to that hotel in Nebi. They have to supply eggs, and this is reliance on the tourism value chain. So um, let us all uh, uh, portray Uganda, our motherland, as a blessed destination. Let's be proud of it. Let's be proud of our food. Uh, let's be proud of our cultures, our lives. And at the end of the day, the trickle-down effect is going to impact on you and your family and generations to come. Now, start now and uh, so you'll have a story uh, to tell. Uh, thank you very much, the listeners. Thank you for all the beautiful comments that you've said in the comment section. I've left my number there. So whatever, in case you feel you need to talk uh, further, you need encouragement, you need advice, my number there, feel free uh, to get in touch anytime. Thank you very much and God bless. Huh? Okay, Eddie, thank you so much. So Eddie has given us his parting shots I want to thank you again for joining us this Thursday. It's the Business Recovery Series by Enterprise Uganda. We will be here next Thursday on another exciting uh, topic. I wish you a very good Thursday and a great end to this week. And all the math is about to come to an end. And for the, everyone in the tourism sector, the high season has, the peak season has started. I hope you are tourist, tourism ready, like Eddie has told us. And uh, yeah, let's talk to you when you have made the money and also mentored someone to join you. So until next Thursday, have a great day. And it's bye for now from Enterprise Uganda. <laughs>